As a new inspector, you're going to encounter large and small kitchens with equipment that you may or may not know. We've come to Atlanta to have some helpers show us around and teach us about some of the equipment in their kitchens, what it is, what it's used for, how to clean it, so that you may have a better understanding when you're doing your day-to-day -day work as to what you might be seeing. Let's talk about receiving. It's not every day that you get to inspect or look at a delivery truck, but if you have the opportunity to look inside, it's a good observation to make. In this truck, there's separation of chemicals with the other dry goods, which is important. There's a lot of mixed trucks that mix things together dependent upon the order, but this is a great thing to notice. In a refrigerated truck, you would want to see whether or not they're holding foods at the right temperatures. And if you see something bad, say something. Obviously the operator or the person in charge can take action as to their product, but you might have to call your agency and have someone else get involved if this delivery truck is going to other places. But overall, the receiving of food is impacting food safety. Do they come in and drop the food outside of a cooler and then it sits there? Do they go ahead and put it into the cooler? It just depends on what kind of relationship the facility has with their delivery driver. This is a slicer you're gonna see in most restaurants. It is a very useful piece of equipment, but it is a very hard to clean piece of equipment that is unfortunately known for harboring listeria because deli meats are sliced here. You might slice raw meat on it as well, so it could be a cross-contamination issue in terms of raw and ready-to-eat food, but I'm gonna have Lillian disassemble it because as an inspector, I walk up and I say, wow, this looks really clean. But then when I get my flashlight out and I bend over, I look underneath, I look between, I look in all the grooves while it's assembled and it looks one way. It might look pretty good. And then when she disassembles it and she'll show you how to do that, you can go ahead and start. Lots of pieces, lots of parts. Go for it, girl. And that's gonna go in your dishwasher? Yes. This piece and this piece I'm about to take off can both go through a dish machine. And then the rest will be cleaned by hand. Let's see. So once it's disassembled, we could look at it and see where things have been missed. It's a great uh, learning opportunity for people. It's very visual to show them with your flashlight where they've missed. Never disassemble it yourself. It's very sharp. This blade stays here, so they have to clean all of this while it sits here. They have to wash it, they have to rinse it, and they have to sanitize it. All three steps, removing all debris and making sure that it has those three steps while these go through the dish machine. This is something that unfortunately is a constant source of training because there's always someone new. It's not only dangerous in terms of cutting your finger, but it's also dangerous in terms of bacteria. So good to know. This is a Roboku, infamous Roboku. This is something that is every restaurateur's love because it does what? Shred. Shreds just about anything. Yeah. And so as an inspector, the biggest thing you need to know is, is it clean? So I'm not going to ever want to start messing with it even though it is a food processor, just like I have at home, I'm pretty smart, I could figure it out, but this is not the expert Lillian is. I'm gonna ask Lillian to disassemble this so that I can observe whether or not it's been cleaned appropriately. Has lots of different blades in it, so I would wanna look at the blades, I'd wanna look at the piece underneath, she might hand it to me. Thank you, Lillian. <laughs> And so I'm just making sure that all the crevices are clean because that's where bacteria can be harbored. And yeah, it all comes apart. And you can tell that they've taken it apart uh, because there's no foreign matter in it at all. 
if they were just but it's a good point that if you don't take it apart yourself maybe it's stuck here and you never saw it so you can tell that they take it apart regularly and it's cleaned well so it's like that with any piece of equipment whether it be a food processor a slicer a dicer a cuber whatever it is you don't ever want to disassemble a piece of equipment that you really don't know anything about always ask for help thanks Lillian mm -hmm. All right, we're going to speak about a combi oven and Drake's going to show us what it can do and how he cleans it. Yeah, so this is the combi oven. Um, you can do any cooking method in this oven. Basically, you can steam, uh, sear, bake, roast, pretty much anything you can do in a kitchen. The way you clean it on this model is you would first use the magical spray hose. Yeah, you would use this hose here to spray it out on the inside and then you would Retract it Retract in. Retract it, eh? yeah. <laughs> and then you would go in with detergent and then uh, rinse it out again and do sanitizer to clean it on and this And it has one. a drain and it goes where? Uh, the drain comes out the back here. That makes it easy. So something to note is in terms of inspectors is that some of these machines have a cleaning cycle. This one does not, so that's why he does the three-step process with the buckets, which is great. Another thing I think that's really important about this magnificent machine is that if it's not being used, an inspector should ask about it. They should ask, what do you um, cook in this machine? What kind of processes do you do? So not only do you cook, you could reheat in this machine. So um, they might be doing that when you walk in. Um, there's just a lot of um, potential here for you to talk about processes, even if you don't see it when you're here. So that's important to note. The thermometer that's inside, they go yeah. ahead and you can pull it up. It's this. So you could stick it in the product and monitor the temperature. Where does it register out? Here, Bottom. one of these one. three that aren't lit up because it's not on right now. <laughs> but that's really nice. So that way they can monitor from the outside without opening the door and releasing all the heat. So that thermometer, internal thermometer is a really great asset to this machine as well. Okay, so this is something that they would want to make sure is clean. So they might find that the tip is clean, but you're gonna wanna make sure that the whole entire cord is clean because it's gonna potentially lay in and on food when it's in here. So that's something to note as well. Not just the thermometer itself, but the entire length. Drake is going to show us how this combi oven is a clean in place piece of equipment. It's a little bit different than the other one. It still does all the functions that he discussed but he's going to show us how this one is a clean in place piece of equipment. Check it out. So it looks basically the same as the other one. All the controls are still here. The modes are digital on this one, more of a digital readout. The cleaning chemicals are stored in the machine on this pullout right here. This is the cleaning agent and this is the rinse aid. And this arm is what's going to do the actual cleaning inside the machine. So to put it into cleaning mode, you have to slide it into place with these hooks on the back. And it just goes straight in the back like this. So when the arm is properly attached, you should get some different cleaning modes on the machine. And this cycle will take it depends on how how long you put it on for. So like level one is like 40 minutes, level four is like a couple hours. We're gonna be discussing several pieces of equipment that can be used for cooking or reheating in a kitchen. First, we're gonna start with the stove. A stove is what you have in your homes, right? This one is a gas stove, so it has a flame that is direct heat, so it's quick. The oven in most homes, there we go, see the oven? It is indirect heat, so it's gonna be slower. You can cook or reheat on a stove or in an oven. Stove's fast, oven is slow. So when you see someone using a stove or an oven, you need to ask what their process is and what process they're performing. So that way you can evaluate where they're at in the process. The grill can be used for reheating, but most commonly used for cooking, raw animal foods generally. 
It's direct, fast heat as well. They can control this by the knobs on the bottom. So they might be cooking one item here and another item here. You just have to kind of be aware that it has those controls and ask lots of questions. The flat top is very versatile and loved by many. It can do even more. So you can cook on it, you can reheat on it. And some people even in a, maybe in a back corner are hot holding. They might start the process of cooking on a higher side and then as it's done and complete, they're gonna put it to the left-hand side that might be set at a lower heat setting to hot hold until it's ordered. It's kind of like a stage process. So when you walk up to this, you can't ever assume that it's just cooking or that they're reheating on it. You have to ask lots of questions. This is, in all of these actually, cleanliness is important, but the process is actually the riskiest thing that you need to evaluate. If they're not cleaning things, it could create a pest issue. It could create some cross-contamination problems, but it's less cross-contamination than it is pest issues. Up above, you'll see a hood system. The hood system to food safety people is removing of heat and helping the condensation and the dripping of grease to stay off the food. The fire department loves the food system for protection of the building, which is also important. But in terms of food safety people, we're interested in the cleaning of it and the functioning of it, not whether or not they have it. So to evaluate this, we want to make sure that it's removing the heat so you can hear it, the sound of the fans. The drip pan is going to collect grease that drips down from it being collected, then we're gonna to need to make sure that they take it down, empty it, clean it, clean the surfaces in order to prevent anything from coming down on the food that's being prepared. What you see here is a tilt skillet. It can be used for cooking or reheating large amounts of food. A great thing about this piece of equipment is that when you're going to clean it, to wash, rinse, and sanitize is simpler because it tilts down to get the water out and into the floor drain. So for an inspector, you need to know what process is occurring when you see it being used, or even if you're not seeing it being used, you should ask, what processes and what foods do you cook in here? Do you reheat in this piece of equipment? How do you clean it? And this one is equipped with a thermometer, which is great. One thing for an inspector to know, I usually ask, are you using the thermometer, which is nice to know. What, what kinds of temperatures do you cook your foods to? So you can ask those questions, but you really need to make sure that they know to wash, rinse, and sanitize this piece as well, because although it's designed to hook on the edge, it's likely to touch the food and food contact surfaces as it's being used. So this entire piece needs to be washed, rinsed, and sanitized, or it could cross-contaminate the cooked food. And this can be removed, it appears. A tilt skillet's really great. You're not gonna see it everywhere, but when you do see it, I want you to recognize what it is and how to use it. So this is Kira. She's going to talk to us about how she uses a steam jacketed kettle. So what we have here is the steam jacketed kettle. Um, you can boil, simmer with soups and chowders as well. Um, there's no visible flame, so all the heat is going to come from the inside. And we have the controls right here for the temperature, so you can control how hot or how much heat that you want. And you put whatever you need to in here. Um, and as far as cleaning is concerned, we're going to start with, of course, washing, rinse, and sanitize. We don't use this faucet for anything but filling. Then you're able to, of course, turn it off when we're not using it. <laughs> um, we have this little latch right here, which releases it. We have a little catch tray down here. So you're able to pour out whatever. The soap, right? You pour so, the soap out. Yes. Before then you, you sanitize and it catches everything right here in the drain. We're able to take this out as well, put this in the dishwasher um, and then wipe this out, of course, with our sanitizer and wash. 
Very good. So one thing as an inspector, you'd want to make sure that they wash, rinse, and sanitize this piece of equipment after they're done using it. And then oftentimes you might see that the fresh water faucet is hanging below the flood rim of the kettle, which isn't good in terms of backflow. So this one's super great. There's a, a large air gap there, and so they're covered in that respect. All right, so this is a rice cooker. They're used frequently in restaurants, but if you see a rice cooker, one of the first things that you're going to want to find out is are they doing sushi? Because sushi rice is a whole nother level of rice. So that was just a question you should ask. But rice has been implicated in many foodborne illness outbreaks. And so we wanna know when you see a rice cooker, are they cooking the rice currently? Are they holding the rice? If they're holding, you take a temperature. If they're cooking, you won't mess with it. There's commonly buildup on rice cookers. They're not cleaned all that great. So sanitation is important for washing, rinsing, and sanitizing. Ask them how they clean it. Those are the most important things to know about rice cookers. This is an Alto Sham. This one's actually extra special. And I wouldn't know that necessarily as an inspector other than there's, it says power, cook, hold, and smoke. And there's some smoking chips at the bottom here that would go into this machine, but it's a smoker. So an Alto Sham is a brand that could be lots of different pieces of equipment. So just know that if you don't know what it is, ask what it does and ask how they use it. Uh, that's the most important thing is asking how they use a piece of equipment. It might do way more than what they use it for, but you should be asking about it. Ask the questions. It smells really good. It can do all those power, hold, cook, cook and smoke. So they have all these different processes that they can do. This is really nice. You don't see these everywhere. I bet you can't guess what this is. It is a microwave. Looks like the one you might have at home. This one says commercial on the outside, commercial microwave. So when you see a microwave in a restaurant or a food facility, don't assume it's just used for quick reheating. Ask them, what do you use the microwave for? That'd be the first question. And then you would wanna know how do you clean it and how often do you clean it? Those are really the things that you need to know. If they're cooking raw animal foods in a microwave, you need to ask more specifics about it because there's a lot of regulations surrounding it in many jurisdictions. So know your code and apply the rules correctly. Lillian is going to talk to us about the first step in the sous vide cooking process, which is vacuum packaging. This is a very large machine, much larger than anything else you'll probably see um, used in the regular restaurants, but it still does the same process. So why don't you show us how this works with the fake food, by the way, what this is. Fake food, yes. So we have special bags that we'll put it in. And of course, when you're placing food in the bags, you wanna make sure you don't get any food where you're gonna be vacuum sealing, because that will break the seal. When you're putting it in, sometimes it's a two-person job to hold this open. You place the food inside. Make sure that you've got the open part of the bag over the seal. And then you slam it closed. This is sealed at the top when it's finished. On the countertop, we have an immersion circulator. It aids in the process of sous vide cooking. So if you happen to see something that looks like this, it would indicate that they're doing that type of process, which requires a HACCP plan. But the immersion circulators actually come in lots of different ways. You can get a stick, a small one that you put in a small container. You can get this nice high dollar one. So it may not look completely like this, but the process are, are the same. And Kara's going to talk to us about sous vide cooking and what it does and what it is. Absolutely. So like Miss Autumn said, this is an emergency circulator. So you would use this to cook 
products low and slow, which is what we would call it. So at a lower temperature for a longer period of time. So right here we have our on button and off button. Make sure that it's plugged in. You're gonna press the on button. It's gonna show our temperature right here. We also have a Celsius and a Fahrenheit. This knob controls that and is able to convert whichever that you need. You wanna make sure that your product is sealed first before you put anything in the water. When it's at the correct temperature, you would just place your sealed product in the bath. And again, able to just control the temperature right here. Of course, when you're cleaning it, you want to wash, rinse, and sanitize and make sure it's off before you do so. Yep. Another thing to note is that generally speaking, and we were talking about this earlier, that it's a lower temperature for a lot longer. The reason why they're doing this is to keep the moisture in the food and for it not to dry out. So there's lots of techniques and uses for it, but this is something that an inspector would need to be able to identify. This piece of equipment is a blast chiller. They too come in all shapes and sizes. Blast chillers are going to be a restaurant's best friend if they want to cool large quantities of food quickly, which is what we want as well. This cools it much, much faster than it would in a regular refrigerator. Drake's going to show us how this piece of equipment is used here. Yeah, so uh, all you really need to do is put the food inside the main chamber here. You could essentially fill up the whole mm -hmm. rack. Yep. You could, yeah. And then you want to put the thermometer the in. Yeah, yeah, you can monitor it with the thermometer here. I would just pretend. Just yeah. <laughs> and then you'll come here and turn it on, and choose the cycle you want. That's how um, how fast and how frozen you want it. And it's got an automatic mode, so you can just start it. Simple as that. Yep. Cold food. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>When approaching a walk-in cooler, you can see the thermostat on the outside of the cooler to see the temperature. The plastic curtains that sometimes hang are a good way to keep the cold air in when people are going in and out of the cooler. It can be a source of contamination. The speed racks that you might see in a cooler are used sometimes for staging of food and cooling of food. The thermometers that you see in a cooler can be a good indicator of the ambient air temperature inside. The back of the cooler is going to be colder than the front of the cooler where the door is opening and closing. Just something to note, the speed racks that are rolled in and out of the cooler bring anything from the kitchen inside the cooler. It's not necessarily that important being that the food isn't directly sitting on the floor, but if there's contamination issues, this could be a source. You're going to be looking for things in a walk-in cooler that are maybe improperly cooled. If you see a lot of plastic containers with lids on them, you'd wanna check the temperature of these cooked foods to ensure that they're the right temperature. If they're high in temperature, they might not have been cooled adequately, especially if the cooler is cold. All right, so this is a four compartment sink. In a four compartment sink setup, you're going to be rinsing off the dishes here. So you're gonna have lots of food debris. It would go in the first sink because you don't wanna get all of that into your wash water. So as an inspector, you would wanna come up to the sink and make sure that everything's working, um, nothing's leaking. Um, so. And then this sometimes will be down into the sink like too far, so it creates a backflow issue. So you wanna make sure that the spray hose does not go down into the basin. Then in the wash sink, this is an Ecolab system, but you just have to turn the knob and it should dispense water and soap at the same time so it mixes it. Not required by the food code, but it's really nice for the people that get to use it. Third sink is just plain water. There won't be anything in it. And then Lillian's gonna show us how the fork sink is filled and tested. So this will be, you can go ahead. You can get your sanitizer going. This sink, yeah, I think it was turned off. Yeah, there we go. So it mixes sanitizer and water at the correct levels, hopefully the goal is. And 
It's going to be cold water, as they've actually written on their wall, which is a great reminder because this sanitizer requires that the water be between 65 and 75 degrees, so that way the chemical doesn't evaporate and dissipate. And so she's filled it here, and as you're testing it, if there was large amounts of foam, you wouldn't want to take the test strip and put it into the foam itself because it would make it appear to be stronger than what it is. So you can go ahead, Lillian, and test it and then you compare it. How long does it go in there? Um, the directions say to compare it right away to the chart. So it's always a good reminder yes. to, to read yes. the directions. These are all different, so. Yeah, gonna... and that's a great point. So them being all different, every chemical by a different manufacturer is gonna have a different direction. So you always have to check. Mm -hmm. So, yep, looks good and um, test it out great. One thing to note about these particular dispensers, something that an inspector would worry about would be the introduction of chemicals into the water system. These are designed with a backflow preventer on the inside. Each one of these components inside has an air gap. And so the air gap will prevent any of the chemicals from mixing back into the main water line and back into our drinking water. So you can see that by the indicator on the outside of this cover. This is a single rack dishwasher that uses chemical sanitizer rather than heat. This facility has several different test strips within their holder. I can eliminate this one based off of what it says on the top that it's used for a specific chemical at another sink. Mechanical dishwashers do not use quaternary ammonia as a sanitizer in a dish machine. They use chlorine based sanitizer. So these are the test strips I'm going to use. This machine, you're gonna be able to see the chemical placement here. The chemicals are mounted underneath the dishwasher. And as we run, you're gonna be able to see what chemical is dumping into the system at that time. And I'll walk you through it. So we're gonna raise and pretend that you've put a rack of dishes in. We'll close the door, it's gonna automatically go. And this first cycle, you're going to see the soap advance in and it'll be very sudsy and it'll wash for a while. Once that cycle's over, it will drain and go to the next cycle. So we're gonna wait patiently for that and I have my test strip ready. So that way when the chemical goes into the system, I'll be able to automatically compare it to the legend on the chemical test strip holder. It's fine if you use your own, but it's always best to use the facilities or even better yet, have the operator, the person in charge, the dishwasher test it for you so that you can see it's draining now. You want to see that they know how to test the machine. So now that it's drained, it's put the stopper back in and it's going to put in this water and sanitizer. So we can see advancing and placing the sanitizer in. This is labeled sanitizer. This is rinse, so I already know what's what. And it's gonna sanitize all the dishes that are in there. And we're gonna test it. And then you compare it. Definitely don't want it there. Right here is where you really want it. If for some reason it doesn't come back with a reading at all, and you see that it is turning and trying to dump chemical in, they might be out of sanitizer. They might have just replaced the bucket of sanitizer and there's an air bubble in it. You can ask the person in charge to what we call prime the machine. When you prime a machine, what you're doing is forcing the chemical through. It's a toggle right here. You would only do that to add more sanitizer if there's an air bubble and it's not advancing at the assigned rate. And that's something the operator can do. It's good to teach them that so that way they don't have to call out their repair guy every time. But that won't happen if they're changing their chemical as it goes down and, and doesn't deplete. So that's how a chemical dishwasher works. I'm going to show you underneath the dishwasher where you can find the chemicals that it's drawing from. So underneath this machine, you'll find the detergent, the rinse aid, and the sanitizer. The chlorine-based sanitizer is generally yellow. 
So if you're not getting a reading on your test strip, you could look to see, is the container empty? It could be that simple. But it's also an indicator that they're using chemicals. It's also an indicator that, yes, they're using chlorine sanitizer. That's another way to know. This is a Champion dishwasher. The one you've seen in the past is a single rack dishwasher. This is what we would call a conveyor dishwasher. Kara's gonna help me lift the doors so that way you can see what's inside. Normally, this isn't an opportunity you may have. So. So the thing I really wanted you to know that one, it's never gonna look this clean, but two, um, all of the pieces come out to be cleaned at the end of the evening or the end of the shift, whatever their policy is. But the thing I want you to see is that there are these curtains between the wash, it starts here, wash, rinse, and sanitize steps of this machine. This too is a dishwasher that is a heat sanitizing machine. It has a booster heater, so you're not having to test with a test strip. It will be tested and Kiara is gonna show us how that's done using a thermometer. So right here we have our start and stop. Autumn is gonna turn on our boost heater. Yeah, these are the different levels of temperature. This is a mix. Wow. That's so cool. Like this is air, like a like a, like a fireplace. Like it just it sucks it up. Yeah. It's already hot. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Super loud. It is super loud. I see. Told ya. So an inspector should always ask the person that knows the most about a machine and ask them to run it for you. And what are you going to be running through the machine here? So we're going to run our thermometer right here, which is waterproof. So we can test the temperature, make sure that it's hot enough. We've already closed the doors, make sure everything is sealed. So no water spewing out or anything. And we have this right here, which catches all of the debris from all of the dishes. Um, so kind of like your garbage disposal, close that, make sure that it's locked in. Miss Autumn's gonna press start. So I can right, push it through. Ooh, success. 160. So in a chemical sanitizing machine, you could check the chemical um, from underneath the curtains, but this slides out and you wouldn't want to pull the rack out too quickly because the sanitizing step happens here. So you wouldn't want to cheat the time by pulling the rack out. So you'd want to let it do its job and come all the way through. The food code has certain requirements of wash, rinse, and sanitize steps. So these gauges can help you determine if they've reached all of those. Sometimes if your final rinse isn't good, it might be affected by other stages in the cycle. So you have the first one, which is just the 10 minute one, and it's telling just to make sure there's nothing in there. And what it is, it's just super hot water that just goes in here and it softens up all the gunk from all the, the fat and the grease that drip from the, the birds. Um, and then you have the one, the, the next three, which are the ones with the solution that goes on the side. I'm not quite sure what's in the solution, but I just know it's supposed to help shine and clean and 
makes it all pretty. The first one is the one that you do, we do about after every round of birds. Um, and then the one with the chemical at the end of the night, you do the 30 minute one, get in there, scrub it down some more. And then you do the hour and a 20 minute one. And it's the same thing, it's just longer, but it's just- When do you do which cycle? So the first one is after, after every, every round. round. Yeah. And then at the end of the night, you do the next three. Which oh, is, you do all three. Yeah. First thing you want to do is unplug. <laughs> the glider comes on just like that right there. You need to open the door where the blade's at. Go pull that off. Pull that off. Blade dies. Off. And this one is always here, the tricky part, get cleaned out in there. Got two levers underneath. To release that, that's coming off. When you're cleaning this right here, if you don't turn it upside down and you can take a spot, this dries pretty bad right there. So you can spray it off if you think you got it, but you'll see particles if you don't. That fat deposit, right? Okay. Your uh, adjustment plate. Got a little knob right back here. Raises up. Kind of off like that. Now this got the tricky part. You got to take the blade off. Got a lever back here, releasing the tension. Now this is, I thought you gotta give it a little shake. Give it enough. There's another part right there that don't get cleaned very good right there when you Give it a little shake. Maybe come off just like that. Do people try to take a shortcut and not remove the blade? They do. Yeah. But you'd be able that, that to. That takes years of practice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I take the plate off. This wheel right here. And that comes right off. Now it comes the hard part. I think you still a guy. This is here that pulls out. This wheel here does not come off. This is where you find your biggest problem. So you really got to get in there and uh, with your little scratch or whatever. And uh, and you use the hose system? Yeah, we use the hose. I've got that deep. And your little fat tub that comes out of there. Once again, if I'm, if I'm doing it, I'm spraying with the hose. Get the grooves clean, I'm going to spray, I'll turn it, you know, and then uh, by then you're getting things kind of, and then of course we start out with the soap part of it, and then you get things so that's kind of soapy where it's easier to get your little white pad back there. And uh, so you wash, rinse, and sanitize. Yes. Well, and you do this how often? Because this is a refrigerated room we're in right now. So how often is this done once a uh, day? Close to every four hours. The four hour thought is if an inspector were to inspect a bandsaw in a non-refrigerated room, it would definitely be every four hours. Right. Yeah. But because it's in a refrigerator, it depends on how cold it is as to how frequently you have to wash it. But it's very cold in here. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> These two nuts will come off, this plate will come off, and all you gotta do is push this forward, and then, then it releases from that deal back there. And, and the whole center out. comes out. And to reiterate. Now, Henry's paper, we don't do that. But like he was saying, you know, when we do it, when we're you didn't clean it. Me, personally, when I did I'd always rub my hand behind there. 
you know, before when I got done spraying it. But but then the yeah, gaskets too we'll, come we'll, off. We'll bring the holes and stuff over here, you know, and it's got a lot of pressure to it. We'll bring it to the gas. Same way I do the saw right here. They're right in here. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, that gets the build up and they'll spray it, and you don't get it clean or whatever. But, uh, yes. Uh, but that's a bad spot. We have shared a lot of equipment with you. You will see this equipment in large kitchens and small kitchens, but inevitably, you will not be able to know it all. Please make sure that you ask questions of the person in charge. Ask them, what is this equipment? What is it used for? And how do you clean it? Those are things that you need to feel comfortable asking them. And then in the end, you as a food safety expert need to be able to determine the risk associated with the process or with that piece of equipment and help determine why is it important. Thank you for all the work that you do every day to keep the public safe.